As the youngest woman ever elected to the California State Senate, Hurtado's 14th district is California's great Central Valley, is home to some of the richest and most fertile farmland in the world. In the legislature, Hurtado is known as a thoughtful policymaker who works across party lines to improve the quality of life for residents and ensure that rural voices are heard at all levels of the government. She focuses on rural community issues, access to clean air and water, food insecurity, inequities in environmental policies, agriculture, and access to health care in rural communities. Hurtado is the first in her family to graduate from college. She's got a very compelling personal story. She received her degree in political science from Sacramento State University. So please join me in welcoming Senator Melissa Hurtado to the stage. Senator. I will start by opening the bottle of water because I always, <laughs> this is a topic that I deeply care about and have a lot to say about as well. But you know, thank you, Sarah, for the great introduction and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. All right, okay, we sound a little bit more awake now. <laughs> I see that we have some of the brightest minds uh, here to discuss resiliency in our food and agriculture system. Resiliency is part of my own family's DNA and history. My grandfather was a farmer until the land went dry in his village. Facing poverty and food shortages, my grandfather came across the opportunity to join the Bracero program and work fields across Western states. Shortly after my father and uncle followed my grandfather in search of what they referred to as the Central Valley Dream. Those memories of food shortages and poverty in Mexico are painful for them and difficult to share. But for my parents, California agriculture was a path to a better life. No education was needed, just passion for agriculture and a strong work ethic. Ingredients all essential to resiliency. They labored in poultry plants and livestock yards to support themselves and give us, their children, opportunities for a better life. I have to admit, I wouldn't be standing where I am today if it weren't for their hard work and their efforts and to the agricultural community for providing them with those opportunities. Little did they know, though, that those challenges they escaped in Mexico are now becoming challenges in the land they saw so much opportunity in. Poverty and famine, famine do not discriminate. Maintaining resiliency in our food production system is essential to our survival. There's nothing more basic to human survival than food and water. Yet our ability to be resilient, our ability to, to be, overcome adversity, our ability to move forward through stress and trauma is being put to the test. Our food and agriculture industry is facing unprecedented lethal threats. Whether it's climate change, historic droughts, global pandemics, regional wars, or economic espionage. Folks, human security is on the line. When we think about food resiliency, we need to also think about nutrition, water, energy, and health. Increasing demands for food, energy, and water can lead to domestic and international conflict, including political instability, migration, and this is often in the context of, of drought. There is emerging evidence that food and water insecurity enhance social conflicts, including protests and violent riots, at least partially by accelerating existing grievances. Meeting growing demands for food, water, and energy will require closer and greater coordination at global, regional, national, and multilateral institutions and governance. The conflict in Ukraine is an example of this. The future, according to the United Nations, could increase famine around the world. They believe that every nation will suffer the consequences of food shortages if the war continues. But as a state senator from the Central Valley, I'm lucky enough to know and represent some of the most resilient men and women in the world. The people who work in California agriculture 
define resiliency. And they lead the most resilient industry on the planet. From floods, freezes, droughts, and wildfires, we experience them all. And the severity, frequency, and intensity of these disasters are increasing, threatening the ag industry, our food supply, and global security like never before. But the people of agriculture keep moving forward. They continue bouncing back. They fearlessly pursue innovative practices so that we can continue feeding the world. Resiliency is ingrained in our culture. And it's demonstrated through generations of sustainable farming practices that have made us a world leader in food production. So today, I don't need to teach the people in this room about resiliency. You embody it every day. But as a state senator, I do need to work with you to prepare for the future and help create government policies that support your ability to be resilient. There is much more we can do and should be doing to help the people who produce our food supply. As a chairwoman of the newly formed Senate Select Committee on Human Security, I am working to educate myself, my colleagues, and other Californians about our food system, the future of water in our state, and how this will all impact our own resiliency. In the middle of this historic drought, we have yet to enact holistic policies that will help preserve our water, our environment, our food supply, and our overall resiliency. In my mind, we must address the resiliency of our food and agricultural system through a multi-pronged approach. We must deal with the current crisis, anticipate and prepare for future emergencies, and provide our ag industry with the tools, resources, and policies necessary to remain world leaders in food production. And that starts with water resiliency. I'm proud to have co-authored Senate Bill 559, known as the State Water Resiliency Act. It secured $200 million in the state budget, $100 million last year, and once again this year, we secured another $100 million to fund overdue repairs to our state water conveyance systems. Construction is already underway, which will not only help us prevent and prepare for future droughts, but will also help us preserve our environment and protect the animals who inhabit the many wetlands and our water delivery systems. Still, until further full repairs are made, we will continue to lose way too much precious water as it travels through the state's canals, water we cannot afford to lose in this climate. Western states are being asked to come to an agreement on how we can collectively reduce water consumption. The Bureau of Reclamation believes an additional 2 million to 4 million acre feet is needed to protect critical levels. And if states are not able to come to an agreement, the Bureau intends to step in. We must engage these regions and the representatives now. We must tell our story and ensure they understand it. It is their story too. Many of our communities and water districts are plagued with uncertainty. To combat this uncertainty this year, I have joined forces with a colleague from the East Bay, Senator Cortezzi, to improve the transparency of how decisions surrounding water are made. We are also working together on an effort to understand who is purchasing water rights in California and the Western United States. We have a growing concern that these rights are being purchased by investment companies and that these purchases could impact water access. We wrote a letter to the Department of Justice asking them to investigate more fully and explore if any of these companies are purchasing water rights and using them for illicit purposes. We are, wa we, we are still awaiting a response. But part of looking at the future of water is, exam is, is examining some of the weaknesses and vulnerabilities we face. We know and have a good understanding of how water shortages and drought make our state vulnerable. But we haven't discussed how we're vulnerable from a cybersecurity perspective, for example. While this may sound like something out of a movie, the threat of cyber attacks on our water and food systems is very much a reality. There have been reports that show that the number of attempt attempted attacks on the cyber networks of our utilities has increased substantially. One of those attacks occurred last year. 
and highlighted the, the risk our water and water treatment plants are facing. In this attack, the hackers targeted the chemical treatment of a drinking water plant in the Bay Area, raising the chemicals to dangerous levels. Fortunately, staff at the plant noticed the increases and managed to reverse them before it was too late or caused any harm. A similar attack took place in Florida, and a third took place in New York. This time, though, the hackers infiltrated the cyber infrastructure of a dam. And were it not for that, the fact that maintenance was being conducted that day, that would require the manual disconnection of the physical uh, infrastructure, the dam, and the releases of it would have been in the hands of the hackers. Facilities in California are still at risk, not only from attacks such as the one in the Bay, but also from phishing, ransomware, and other scams that could impact individuals or even control the release of water, something that could be devastating in a state already plagued by drought. Cyber attacks from domestic and international threats have been directed at the United States for years, but several recent cyber attacks have exposed major vulnerabilities in our infrastructure including our food to table pipeline. At the end of May 2021, a ransomware attack on JBS, the world's largest meat supplier, required the organization to suspend operation across nine beef processing plants. While the majority of the plants were operational soon thereafter, the company said a ransom of 11 million to shield the plant from any further disruption. This year, I introduced Senate Bill 892, the Cybersecurity Preparedness Act, to help decrease these threats by combating this growing issue through reporting guidelines and encouraging our agencies to, to strengthen our defenses. To do so, I am partnering with another colleague, this time from Orange County. While it is fundamentally important that our cyber infrastructure is secure, it is also important that the land we use to produce our agriculture is physically secure as well. In the past few years, foreign ownership of California agricultural land has steadily increased. Between 2019 and 2020, foreign owners purchased over 40,000 acres of agricultural land in California. In the Central Valley specifically, over 150,000 acres of agricultural land is held in foreign ownership. These land purchases put California's food security at risk, extending not only to domestic use, but also to our exports. My bill, Senate Bill 1084, prevents foreign governments from purchasing agricultural land in California, protecting our food pipeline, and ensuring we are not subject to the decisions of an entity that may not intend to cause us harm, but whose interests may not align or do not align with our own. We are also looking at biosecurity and the threat posed by future infectious diseases. We have not done enough to prepare for the next disease we could face that may be lurking just right around the corner. Pest disease and contaminants that threaten plants and animals also threaten the integrity, reliability, sustainability of our food systems. This was clear in our fragmented response as a nation to COVID-19. We must be better prepared. And for that reason, I authored Senate Bill 453 to put California at the forefront of research on emerging infectious disease and biosecurity. SB 453 lays the groundwork to ensure our state and the nation are better prepared for the next global pandemic by establishing a fund to support research in biosecurity and emerging infectious diseases. It is my hope that these efforts, along with all the other important work you are doing, we can reinforce the resiliency of our food and agriculture industries for the next generation. I'm hope, I hope that through our partnerships and idea exchanges, we can come up with more holistic, actionable solutions that will preserve our water systems while securing and supporting our agricultural industry. I want to emphasize once again that human security is on the line here. But I know that resiliency is part of all of our DNA. And I know that the agriculture community is part of, is leading the charge in fighting climate change. I want to thank you all for uh, inviting me to speak and for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the work that we are doing because there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Thank you.
Thank you, Senator Hurtado. And um, yeah, as you can tell, she's so passionate about these issues and we appreciate her so much. Um, I, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna ask one question and ask her to answer here from the podium. And that is that yeah, with the Democratic majorities in, in California, what advice do you have for advocates in agriculture about how they can be more effective working uh, on these policy issues with you and your colleagues? Well, I would say that first is you have to get involved and you have to get, uh, come out and have conversations with elected officials here in, in the Capitol. Uh, and, and just not when, when you know there's a particular bill that you dislike, it's also about education. Because quite frankly, what I've come to realize is that it doesn't matter whether you are a Republican or a Democrat, we all care about food. This is something that we all care about because we all want to live. And when I first got started in the, in the legislature and talking about you know, water conveyance and, and making sure that we invested in, in our, our infrastructure, um, I started talking about it in terms of food security. And that really, that really made a difference in the conversations that, that I had with colleagues, and, and I think that now more than ever, given everything that is going on, they, there's, there's a lot of education that has um, taken place that has put them in a, in, 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 a, in, a, in a place where they are becoming more understanding, but I think there's still a lot more work that needs to be done because, quite frankly, I, it, there's a lot at stake, and so there's a lot more attention that needs to be paid to our ag community because the challenges are, are serious. Thank you very much. Um, please join me in thanking Senator Hurtado for joining us today.